if everyone can hear. Yeah, we have at least some noddings, which is good. This whole virtual thing is so strange for me still. But anyway, what can we do? Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I'm supposed to be chairing the meeting to the, the session today. We won't have me every day, thank God. But um, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you may be. Um, welcome to this online workshop, which is part of a philosophical approach um, to the Vaishnav concept of God research project. Uh, since because this field is kind of undeveloped, it's also towards a philosophy as well. So my name is Alan Herbert. I'll be again chairing this session. I'm also um, a co-director of the project along with Ricardo, Sylvester, Benedict, uh, Paul Gurk. Before I get to the workshop and to introducing today's first speaker, let me, if I may, give you a brief, but hopefully informative, and I'm also aiming for painless uh, introduction to the project itself. So um, let me see. So I'm gonna have to, it's a bit of a mouthful. So first of all, um, the project has been made possible through a small project grant from the John Templeton Foundation awarded through the Global Philosophy of Religion Project, um, hosted by the Birmingham Center for Philosophy of Religion. Uh, that itself is run out of the University of Birmingham. It is also being hosted by the Brazilian Association for the Philosophy of Religion in collaboration with the Logic and Religion Association. And this workshop is also in collaboration with the Institute for Vaishnav Studies and Seminary and the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Okay, so there's, as for the whole project, there's several components to it, um, which in totality run for about a year. Um, there's this four day workshop, an additional conference, which will happen towards the end of the year, uh, an edited volume, which we're in the process of producing and a journal special issue that will contain additional papers looking at, at this particular issue. So the seed of this project as a whole was sowed about a, a year or so ago with the question, what is God like for Vaishnavas? In other words, what is their concept of God? Uh, our initial observation leading to this question was of a, of a problem, which is that different practitioners of even one of the many Vaishnav traditions either hold different concepts of God or are unable to properly define their own concepts of God. Uh, for whatever reasons, uh, a number of the Vaishnav traditions I know of seem to promote either diverse or fluid concepts of God with attributes that can overlap or that sometimes seem contradictory. And this also to a degree applies to the text that they source or consider authoritative. Uh, this not only seemed like a fertile area for research for us, but also there's very little, very little out there um, even addressing uh, this particular and important issue. So I, I hope it's clear that by the research question, what is God like? We're not talking about a description of God as Vishnu, Narayan, or Krishna, or Radha, or Nishringa, or Varaha, or whoever, or whatever. Uh, and that this particular form has these features, X number of arms and possibly Y number of alternate forms or avatars and so on. We're talking about a more fundamental question, namely, in what way does each tradition conceive of God as God in a seemingly monotheistic or another way? Whether the God conceived is transcendent, in other words, distinct from the world and its populace, uh, imminent or within all beings, panentheistic, which essentially is a God that, that is in nature, in which I include living beings, but is itself more than nature, or a mixture of all these, and, and this among many other different possibilities. Um, Although the concept of God has traditionally been approached by analytic scholars in the philosophy of religion and those of the Abrahamic traditions through outlining God's attributes, namely properties and, and uh, quality, shakti sometimes, we are not avoiding nor are we limiting ourselves to this approach. Our guiding question is whether God or God with attributes can be conceived adequately in this tradition or in that text. Uh, even if this is minimal, that God can be adequately conceived minimally, then we have at least an adequate concept of God. If, if God cannot be adequately conceived, in other words, if there are contradictions or if that which we've conceived is insufficient, for instance, then we have a problem. 
the challenge for any tradition is to hold and to promote an adequate and consistent concept of God. Otherwise, it would seem that they don't know what the God they're addressing, accessing, or worshipping is. Um, in this workshop over the next four days, we have two kinds of presentation. Today, we have Professor Graham Oppie and Professor Rebecca Chan, who will present on the overriding issues in the philosophy of religion regarding the concept of God. Unfortunately, Professor Benedict Gurker, who was originally also um, speaking on these issues as well today, and is also a co-director of the project, as I mentioned, could not make it for health reasons. We wish him all the best in his recovery. Uh, we also have today a representative of the other authors that will present in the next three days, in Professor Angelika Malina. Uh, she will speak on the concept of God in the Vaishnav text, the Mahabharata, one of the famous epics. Tomorrow, we'll hear about and discuss three other texts that the Vaishnava source, namely Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Purana, and the Pancharatra Jayaka Samhita. Samhita. And in the following two days, we'll be looking at some of the main traditions, for instance, those of Madhva, Nimbarka, Bushti, Marg, Chaitanya, and the Alvars, among others. Uh, the full list is in the schedule that you hopefully have. If you don't have it, let us know and we'll send you one. Um, all the speakers or presenter in this workshop are authors. We have asked each presenter to speak for a maximum of 25 to 30 minutes. We can then have another 10 to 15 minutes for discussion. In other words, each presentation should fit within a 40 minute time period. If you have a question, comment, or issue you want to bring up with them, raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll figure that out. And we'll try to get to you before time is up. Um, if we do run out of time, then bear in mind that we will have a, a, a short kind of wrapping up session at the end where we'll all hopefully get another chance. So with no further ado, as they say, um, we can begin with our first esteemed speaker, Professor Graham Oppie, by way of a brief introduction, and I'll make this very brief so you can start. Uh, professor Graham Oppie is currently a professor of philosophy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, um, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities, the foundation editor of the Austral Australasian Philosophical Review, as well as being on several editorial boards, the list goes on. Although mostly publishing in philosophy of religion, he has also published in many other areas, including metaphysics, epistemology, and philosophy of science. His major research interest has been in arguments about the existence of God, on which he has also published, including on ontological arguments, cosmological arguments, Pascal's wager, and arguments from evil. He's also completed a large grant-supported project on multi-faith dialogue involving philosophers from a wide range of different religious traditions. Today, today, Professor Oppie, we're talking about some fundamental questions that arise when we start thinking about the deity. So it is about thinking about God. So over to you, Professor Oppie. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, has that come up? You can see my PowerPoint? Yep, okay. Um, so what I thought I'd do is put together some thoughts about sort of, sort of general thinking about the divine with the little that I know about kind of similarities and differences between Eastern and Western religions. Um, and it may turn out that most of what I've got to say about the kind of similarities and differences is quite naive, but I'll, it'll be interleaved with the things that um, I wanted to say about sort of fundamental questions about thinking about the divine. So off we go, hang on, I can't make the change with this problem. Ah, maybe it'll, maybe it'll work now. So I, I think that um, the possibilities the kind of range of possibilities for thinking about the divine are quite similar in Western traditions and Eastern traditions, as far as I know. And the kind of important differences between Eastern and Western traditions, as I see it, kind of lie elsewhere. Um, and I think that probably the single most significant difference um, between um, Eastern and Western religions lies in the conception of what at least loosely you might call the temporal extent of causal reality. So in the Abrahamic religions, which I'm going to think of as, the, as Western, though, you know, they're kind of, I mean, all of these religions are now global. Uh, in the Abrahamic religions, causal reality has a fixed beginning and involves no cycles. 
even though it might span different domains. It depends whether you think that the life to come is going to be in this domain or in some other domain. In contrast, in um, the kind of Indian religions, causal reality is past eternal. Causal reality involves long-term cycles of development and decline or flourishing and chaos. And within this framework, there's lots of similarities. And so one of the ones that struck me kind of looking at some, of, some material before I started to do the talk is that by, in both Eastern and Western religions, you find some traditions in which there are avatars or incarnations of the divine. In some Western traditions, there is or is expected to be just one incarnation of the divine that permanently sets things right. Uh, immediately, I want to put a little asterisk against this. So since, since Kant produced the nebula hypothesis, there have been people in the West who've wondered about whether there are other populated planets, and if there are, whether there are creatures like us on those planets, and if so, how the incarnation that happens on our planet is going to be of any use to people on other planets, and there's a kind of, at least a kind of bunch of people from the early 19th century who thought actually maybe each planet gets its own incarnation but they are, you only need one per planet so strictly it's not maybe it's not one incarnation for all of reality maybe it's one for each kind of set of largely isolated creatures like us at least sometimes in eastern traditions there are many incarnations even within a single cycle that help to restore the balance between good and evil, right? So, um, let's see, this is working now. Now, in both types of religions, the shape of causal reality is connected to the ultimate goals set by the religion. So, in Western religions, there's a one-stop trajectory from birth to the final destination, to eternal heaven, or on some views, eternal hell, on some views, annihilation for some, and so on. Whereas in lots of the Eastern religions, there's a great deal of cycling before some kind of escape is achieved or suffering comes to an end or whatever. So now on to the stuff that I want to say about divinity. So in both types of religions, we find some kind of notion of ultimate ground. There are many different ways in which the relationship between what I'm still going to call kind of loosely causal reality and the ultimate ground can be conceived. One way in which difference manifests is related to the difference in views of the shape of causal reality. It's just much easier to think of the ultimate ground as itself a cause if you suppose that the causal past is finite. It's very hard to think about it as a cause if you think of the, the past as being infinite. Some people say there are more subtle differences that turn on whether the ground is taken to be imminent or transcendent. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that that's really a difference that um, operates across the traditions, but maybe we can talk about that later. What is the relationship between the ground and other stuff? Well, some people just think of the relationship as what in analytic philosophy now gets called a grounding relation small g grounding relation. You might think that this relation is sui generis, that there's a particular relation between the ultimate ground and the world that's different from other familiar kinds of grounding relations, identity or constitution or supervenience or whatever you think that other sorts of grounding relations are. And so looking at this, you might think, you might think that that grounding relation is identity. That will give you something like pantheism. You might think of the grounding relation as something like emergence and um, um, that might give you something that's a bit closer to panentheism. You might think that, um, that there's a kind of asymmetric permeation relation. If it's asymmetric, that will mean that it can serve as a grounding relation where you think of the divine as permeating um, causal reality, but you don't think of causal reality as permeating the divine. And so in any of those kinds of ways, you might think of the relationship between um, the ultimate ground and causal reality as mediated by a grounding relation. And although I think it's um, some of these views in large parts in Western history have been considered heretical, they've certainly been Western thinkers 
throughout history, um, people who are in the various Abrahamic traditions who've thought about these as alternative ways of thinking about the divine. Okay, so on to perhaps the kind of central thing that I wanted to talk about. I think that across traditions, there are many different views that you can have about what we can properly say about the ultimate ground. How can we talk about it? What can we properly say about it? So one kind of approach, and so I'm going to talk about this now from what I know, the little that I know about Western um, traditions, and leave it as a question for people who know more about this, um, to say something about the extent to which this would be helpful or fit onto um, Eastern traditions. So one thing that you might think is that you can't say anything positive about the nature of the ultimate ground. That is, you can't say anything positive about what its intrinsic nature is. All you can say is negative things. It's not this, it's not that, it's not another thing. And you can find approaches like that in all of the major Abrahamic traditions, sometimes associated with kind of mysticism, but not always. Some of them are just associated with people who belong to quite mainstream um, theological traditions. A kind of slight step up from that, um, and again, I'm going to draw distinctions here that often don't map very well onto reality because you can see tendencies, all of these tendencies in a single thinker or school of thinkers. But a second thing that you might think is that we, while we can talk um, about the kind of intrinsic properties of the divine and not just about our relations to it, all talk of that type that we can give has to be analogical or metaphorical in a way that we simply can't cash out in literal terms. So, for example, we might use words um, that look like they're words that we apply to other things, but there's a kind of semantic stretch or something like that that's involved, and the words just don't mean the same. So when you say, if you say, um, if you're tempted to say that the ultimate ground is good, you might, and you're taking this kind of view, you might say, look, um, it's good, but don't think that when I say that it's good, I mean the same kind of thing that I would mean if I said that a certain person was good or that a certain tool was good or whatever. Uh, it's got a, it's got its own distinctive meaning that you can't in any very clear way pull out from the way that you use the word in talking about other things. Okay, so that's a second kind of, kind of thought that you might have about the language that you can use in talking about the ultimate ground. A step up from that, again, I think, is what I'm going to call um, sparse literalism. There's a few, a tiny number of literal things that you can say about the divine. So one of the kind of traditions that I've got in mind here is the Thomistic idea that God's pure act. And that's about all you can positively say about the intrinsic nature of the divine. And that's meant to be interpreted Literally, right? So, I mean, maybe there's some other things. Maybe you can say that God's simple, right? In God, there's no distinction between essence and existence. In God, there's no distinction between substance and attributes. Um, whatever, some of that's negative. The positive content is quite small, but it's there. Finally, kind of stepping up from that to the position that I'm just, I'm not very imaginative with terms, I'll call it abundant literalism, uh, is a view that actually is quite a lot we can say about the divine nature um, and a kind of fil familiar source for this will be um, kind of American Protestant philosophy of religion in North America. At the moment where you get lots of people who think that God's perfect, God's conscious, God's a person, God has reactive attitudes, a whole lot of stuff like that, all of this is properly attributed to the divine. And my hunch is that you can probably find in diverse religious traditions around the world, and I expect in um, Eastern traditions, that you can find similar considerations about the, what can we, how can we and how are we not able to actually talk about the divine. Um, just related to this, um, since the question of definition did come up, uh, 
There, there's also going to be um, difference on questions of definition within traditions belonging to, say, the West or to the East. Um, it looks as though nominal definition isn't, which I think of as definition in terms of relations to the divine, is not necessarily going to be particularly problematic. Uh, it seems as though if you're giving a nominal, nominal definition, what you're trying to do is just say how to pick this thing out from everything else. Um, and you can do that by just talking about the ways in which you're related to it. But if you want to give a real definition, if you want to say what its intrinsic nature is, then the considerations about exactly what we can say about the divine is going to impact on whether we actually think that we can give a real definition of the divine. And there are certainly traditions in the West that think that we just couldn't possibly be able to do that because that would involve us somehow in um, having abilities and, and of comprehension and so forth that we couldn't possibly have. Okay, what was the time when I started? Um, it was about 10 past, a little bit before that. Alan? You have, you have um, here, you've done, put it this way, you've done 13 minutes so far. Yeah, yeah. I'll only go for a couple more minutes. I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. So um, one thing that I should have said, so when I was making the slides, I made this slide and then thought I should probably put it at before the last two, but then I didn't. So I think both within and across traditions, there are different perspectives on the ultimate ground. So one of the things that you have to think about is when we're, when we're asking for characterizations and, and, and thoughts of, about how to characterize it, are we thinking about how experts, what I'm going to call experts, so theologians, philosophers of religion, um, perhaps spiritual leaders and so on, are going to say, or are we thinking about what ordinary what I'll call ordinary fact, participants, regular participants in religion who may not be kind of theologically reflective or philosophically reflective or whatever, what they're going to say, how they're thinking about the design, the, 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 the divine. Uh, maybe there's an important divide between those who think we know quite a bit about the ultimate ground and those who think that we know next to nothing about the ultimate ground. That's kind of getting closer to questions perhaps about more mystical traditions as opposed to ones which have a much greater um, philosophical history. I mean, again, this is something that maps across um, East and West, I think. And oh, something that I might have said earlier, maybe there's also a significant divide between those who think that there can be avatars in incarnation and those who think that it's somehow inconceivable or blasphemous. So I'm thinking, for example, in the Abrahamic religions that um, it's kind of typical of Islamic views that it's kind of blasphemous to suppose that God could be incarnated, whereas in um, Christian traditions you have the story about the incarnation in, and at least in the Messianic Jewish traditions, you have the thought that there is to be a Messiah and just hasn't arrived. Yet there is to be an incarnation, it just hasn't happened yet. I do wonder whether there are the broad differences between East and West that could be traced to the finite past, infinite past divide. Um, so questions about depravity or original sin versus karma, questions about enlightenment or release from the will versus heaven and so on. But that takes us kind of away from my brief. So maybe I'll just leave it here and we can um, see what people want to say in response to what I've said. Okay, so thank you very much for that. That was very interesting kind of just uh, creating a context in which we can actually try to understand the whole Indian tradition as well. Um, so before we go further, um, do we have any questions or comments or anything anyone would like to add to this? Uh, if you know where the virtual hand thing is, you can do that. Um, keep an eye on here. Otherwise, I'll two participants, let me see who that is. Um, 
So one's Ricardo, I can see he's got his Okay, hand. so why doesn't he, I think he's got the ability to be able to unmute himself. Okay. Can I speak? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Robby, for, for your talk. Very, very, very interesting, very good. Uh, I, have a, I have a question about um, uh, an analogical characterization of God. Uh, because um, that's something that it seems to me, uh, I mean, theologians, they, they use a lot. And in particular, uh, in Hindu tradition, there is a very famous analogy, one put by Ramanuja, and that, 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 that compares the, the relation between uh, God and the cosmos with the relation that there is between uh, the body and, and the soul. And of course, this is very well known among Western panentheists. So my question is, um, if you could speak a little bit about the, the philosophical significance of uh, such a kind of characterization, because many times we are used to definitions, right? To, to, to know, to have a kind of definition about, about a concept. And so if you could elaborate a little bit about if, if for instance, is philosophically enough to characterize something through an analogy. So I think that there'll be a difference of opinion about this. I mean, some people will think that kind of having irreducible metaphors or irreducible analogies is kind of antithetical to the, the sort of analytical philosophical projects. But other people will think that actually there's certain kinds of things that really you can only understand by way of grasping irreducible analogies or irreducible metaphors. And that really is a kind of philosophical difference uh, that it's hard to see could be straightforwardly settled in any kind of way. And I think it's a live um, dispute in current philosophy of religion in the West. Yeah. So I don't know if that's enough to answer the question. Thank you. Um, I have a question, but first let's go to, I think we have Bill over here. Um, so Bill, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, it lays out, I think, does a good job of laying out the broad um, outlines and contexts in which we can come into this um, global comparison of um, perspective, religious perspectives. I was glad that you raised the distinction between what you call experts and uh, what I would call in the West, people in the pew. Um, because maybe I'm showing my phenomenological bias, but the question that I always ask myself whenever I hear a mm, religious debate or dispute and uh, people taking up arms and throwing chairs at each other is um, what difference it makes. And what I mean by what differences it makes, what, um, how does it matter to a person's um, life, how they relate to the divine, how, they, how it relates to their everyday existence? So that, that's my, I, I wonder, um, maybe we were not going to be talking about that in this conference, but um, I'd, that would, that's what interests me more is how these, especially because I'm not as familiar with Eastern traditions, what it's like <laughs> to use that old phenomenological so. Uh, um, what it's like being a Hindu or a Buddhist, as opposed to certain versions of Christianity. And so I'm where these philosophical issues actually um, set up home and uh, find a place in our lives. That, that's, it's maybe that's a comment, but it's also a question for you. Ah, so, so I think it's a good comment. I'm not sure that there's anything very brief I can say, <laughs> good, good and brief that I can say in response to it. Um, and it's often been noted uh, in, by, by um, perhaps uh, free thinkers in the West, so people like Hume, that the kind of role that religion plays in ordinary people's lives often doesn't match up all that well with the descriptions of what they're supposed to believe that are given by theologians and that's one kind of source for 
making sure that you ask this question, I think. And I think that relates to what you're saying about lived experience, right? Um, so there's, there's something that it's, there's something that lots of people take from the religious tradition that they are born into, that they grow up in, that they live with. And part of what they have is their some sort of sense of relationship to the divine. It's not clear that how that intersects with what philosophers of religion and theologians might tell them about what it is that they allegedly believe. I guess I'm just repeating what you said really rather than um, Thank you. sort of adding, adding to it. Um, okay, is there any other questions? Otherwise I have a quick one, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sure. So um, you mentioned um, the nominal definition, which I thought was interesting. And uh, I can correct me if I'm wrong, but that somehow or other you thought it was in certain circumstances sufficient to be able to act as a, a definition for God. Am I right in that? Yeah, so it depends what you want the definition to do, right? So if all you want your definition to do is to isolate what it is that you're defining from everything else, then it doesn't matter whether the characteristics that you're picking on a kind of intrinsic to the thing or essential to the thing or anything like that. What matters is just that they mark the thing off from everything else. And so if the divine, for example, is the only thing that's the appropriate source of certain kinds of attitudes on your part, that might be enough to <clears throat> define in a nominal sense the divine, but it doesn't tell you anything at all about intrinsically what it is and that would it's that kind of intrinsically what it is question which was the one that I thought you were most interested in taking up in this conference right it's the kind of quest for a real definition to put it in scholastic terms yeah this is a the problem that I've come across in different traditions that you have this idea that the divine can somehow especially Indian traditions that the divine can be described by what it, what it isn't like the neti neti thing, you know, the whole thing of, yeah. and even to a degree, you can even go into the Dwaitic thing of Anivarchaniya, this whole thing is inexpressible, you know, and then you have a, a chintya, which is like, you know, inconceivable, all these type of things. And they're very much in the forefront rather than kind of background arguments, you know, they're there. So there is this sense in which there is an ability to be able to, to, to kind of promote it as a positive example of what God is in a sense. And yet, um, at the same time, it seems like that there is a problem with that, even the nominal one that actually, I guess it would have to be an analytic program because you're dealing with like you know, definitions completely. Whereas if you took it outside of definitions into the realm of experience, then you have a problem of someone saying, well, what about that? And what about that? And you're always gonna have someone adding something onto it and just saying, you know, well, that doesn't fully define it because there's this and this and that, whatever. And then you go into the realm of, well, what, what about stuff we don't even know about, you know? so. So there seems like there's an intrinsic problem with actually doing it that way. And sufficiency in the sense, yeah, I agree that it's it's something that you can kind of a, a preliminary way. But like I, like I was trying to say, it's it's there within the traditions themselves, almost as a, it's a forward way of expressing it. Do you find the same thing within other traditions as well, the traditions you deal with, that it's not, that it or is it dealt with very much as, time, as a... As a kind of just a, a simple way of defining rather than make sure a positive definition that we're looking for? So it depends where you look. So if you look at the discussion in, um, say, North American analytic philosophy of religion, um, last year or the year before, John Farnfick published a book, I think it was called Defining God, something like that. And he... In, in that book, his view is that there's kind of three serious contenders for a, just a straightforward definition of God's intrinsic nature as perfect being, um, as worship worthy being, or as cause of everything else that needs a cause. Right? He, interestingly, he tries to claim that the kind of Thomistic pure act thing doesn't even get to the starting blocks, right? So he thinks that there's, and unsurprisingly, he's a Protestant, right? But, but, but this is the, um, that, that's kind of where a certain kind of discussion is at the moment. Um, but those definitions require lots of unpacking and still don't look like 
in any sense, they're going to be adequate to lots of conceptions that people have of God. But that wasn't really, I mean, they would say that's not really the point. The point was just that they that kind of uniquely the God as they, they're conceiving of it is, is the perfect being or is the being that's worthy of worship or is the cause of everything else. Uh, but of course, the adequacy of those as definitions will depend very much on what tradition you belong to and whether, I mean, because you, as, as I said in my talk, you may very well think that um, the kind of causal thing is just not going to work. Right, that, de that, that, that depends on certain other assumptions that you're prepared to make about what causal reality looks like. And that seems to me to be a different unsettled matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've run out of time for this one. So, so we'll, um, actually, no, we haven't. I'm thinking 25 minutes. <laughs> You spoke, you spoke actually quickly. I'm looking, actually, we still have 15, 10 minutes if anyone else wants to, wants to add anything to that. Um, is that Bill over there with a hand up or is that an old Maybe hand? Maybe he up? hasn't. Ha might be no, that, I actually. No, it's a new one. I okay. raised my hand again. And okay. I try to um, bring my comments back to something closer to what we're actually discussing. And so I'm wondering um, when we talk about definitions. Um, whether um, I, I take religion to be a kind of saturated experience in my own sense. And if that's the case, then, um, then any concept of God has to be um, sort of a um, defined, indefinable. It has to have both definable and indefinable aspects to it in order for it to remain um, saturated. And so I have used, at least in some of my work, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Espen Dahl and um, his phenomenology of the holy, um, to, to that, that actually the form of um, religion takes its, takes its origin from the, from the everyday, but it has to intersect with the alien, which is undefinable. And in that sense, then, it, and I'm going to guess this is true of all religions, so I can't tell, but it has to always have an undefinable characteristic in order to remain saturated. Does any of this make any sense? So, so I wonder, so one thing I wonder in response to that, um, because it's a kind of universal claim that about all religions, I wonder whether it's going to be true of, for example, certain kinds of indigenous religions that, that they're required to have this kind of, um, the kind of structure that you described in order for us to sort of count them as religions or not. I wonder whether you've got a view about that. Um, um, I actually, I live close to those regions, as, as you do. Um, I know yeah. you're in Australia. Yeah. Um, but I don't really have any real opinion about it, <laughs> except that I have an affinity. I understand their, their perspective. I can't, I can't really say anything in detail. Yeah. So, because it, it might be that what, what, what you said matches pretty well with um, a lot of mainstream views amongst Christians, Jews, Muslims, and I'm going to guess amongst Hindus as well, um, or people from the Indian religions, so though I could be wrong about that. Uh, but I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether, whether it's going to extend across the full range of religions or not. Um, okay, one, one, before we move on, just one thing I'd written down here, and I was trying to fully understand, if you don't mind, um, this idea of causation, uh, causal reality, and the way you presented it was almost like a, um, a foundational epistemology, where you require a foundation for it, it requires some point where it begins, or some, you know, some events. Oh, sorry, if you want to say something in there quickly. Yeah, so, um, so roughly the kind of simplest way to think about it is just think about the universe. Right? Mm -hmm. That's causal reality. Now, that's too quick, but in a way it, it will kind of do. Um, not th There are disputes within philosophy and within religious traditions too about whether sort of the ultimate um, reality really is 
the universe or whether, you know, maybe we should rather than being kind of realists about um, the world as we find it or the world that, that the universe that's described by science, we should be idealists or we should have some other kind of view. That's why I was kind of hedging what I said. But the, but the idea is that um, roughly it will do the universe, right? The universe that we live in is that, mm -hmm. is that causal reality. And then that kind of standard Abrahamic view is that God causes and sustains that universe, but it's causes, brings it into existence. So it has a finite origin in the past and then sustains us in existence thereafter. And that's what, um, and that's one way of thinking about how the ultimate ground might be related to causal reality, but it's not the only way of thinking about it mm. by any means. Right, right. Yeah, one thing that popped to mind was that whole idea of epistem in epistemology. For some reason, it came to my head that whole coherentist idea that everything. So, so that wasn't what I was thinking about. It was a metaphysical sort of idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I know. I was thinking. Yeah, no, I understand. I was just thinking of like an analogy. That's why it just popped to my head that way. That's so. I was thinking. I, I wonder if there's an analogy to be made with a whole coherentist way of understanding things, that everything is dependent on everything else in some some form or other, and whether the cyclical nature of of specifically different Vaishnav thoughts of creation and cosmology, cosmogony, all this stuff, whether that fits more into that model, or whether there has to be, we have to figure that there is a, a point in time where actually the cause of the thing that right, so, it's out. So this is, but I, I think that you can, um, that the, the metaphysics really doesn't depend on a particular epistemology so you can you can as as i understand it even from the standpoint of scientists sort of making hypotheses about the universe it's kind of an open question whether you have a cycle of bangs and crunches or whether you have a single origin from which from which you have expansion that that's not really a settled question and it seems that one of those views kind of fits better with the idea of a created god than the other one Mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. 